Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Bagram Radian here at the Excel Center in London where we're covering the DSCI Trade Show, world's leading air, land, sea, space, cyber, and security gathering. Uh, our coverage here is in partnership with DSCI and Clarion uh, Events. And we have with us Sash Tuza, uh, who is uh, independent equity research, or an analyst with the independent equity research from agency partners uh, in London, a military specialist as well, uh, and also one of our frequent podcast uh, uh, co-conspirators. Sash, great to see you. Thank you, Bago. Hello. Uh, um, you and I have been talking about the budgetary uh, black hole that's been uh, evolving here. Uh, Secretary of State, uh, we talked to him, uh, Secretary of State Sir Michael Fallon, the British Defense Secretary, we talked to him earlier in the week, uh, and he was very firm that he doesn't recognize the kind of numbers that are being bandied around. Uh, he has made the case that you know, the government is still on track for a 178 billion pound uh, equipment program that was committed to in SDSR 15, the Strategic Defense and Security Review. Now, the Cabinet Office now has conducted an is conducting another review to to bridge some form of funding gap. You listen to the interview with him. Uh, give it, give us a sense on on what. Uh, he's saying, because it looked like he was shifting responsibility from the government on t onto the military services, but also indicating, if I didn't misunderstand it, there was 178 billion pounds of room in which to play. Because I think the effective issue is, the defense budget may be going up by 0.5 or 0.5% or over inflation. The reality is the internal costs are growing far more rapidly. Give us your take. Yeah, um, there was actually much more in your interview with uh, Sir Michael Fallon than uh, I think people would think. Uh, you know, re listening to it, watching it the first time round, it really does repay um, quite close concentration. So let's just break down a couple of the points that he's made. First of all, the defense. Let's assume the defense budget is going up by you know half percent a year. Um, no point in arguing about that at this stage. But what Sir Michael does not say is that the equipment budget is necessarily going up. Um, as fast within that, uh, maybe going up by half a percent over inflation, uh, that would be a good outcome, averaged out over the lifetime of the parliament. There's two problems. The first is that equipment spending just doesn't come in a linear fashion. Uh, you get big blips. We're getting a big blip at the moment purely because of the, the dollar cost of equipment purchased from the US, which was not budgeted for. The second um, problem, I think, is that um, what Sir Michael is clearly avoiding talking about is the issue of defence inflation. Defence inflation runs massively higher than uh, underlying inflation. Underlying inflation at the moment in the UK, I mean, it's just gone up to about 3%, uh, but defence inflation typically runs at 2% plus above that. And there is very, very good documented evidence that that's been the case for a long time to come. So an equipment budget with the best will in the world going up by half a, half a point over inflation is not covering the underlying costs and it's certainly not covering the increased costs of, of uh, dollar products. Um, so I think that the numbers are plain wrong and this is one of the areas where this enormous new bow wave bubble has emerged. The second issue that I think is really interesting about that interview is that what we're seeing is the start of the inquest, the start of the blame game frankly, as to why things have gone wrong. If you'll remember, um, uh, about 10 years ago, we had the Levine reforms. Lord Levine, who uh, was a f himself a former head of defense procurement and very highly respected at the time, although an incredibly abrasive figure at the time, um, came out with a set of reforms for the whole of uh, the Ministry of Defense that devolved spending authority down to the services. And it said, we'll give you a budget, we'll tell you what to do, but then it's up to you service chiefs to go off and um, spend, hit your budget targets. We, the politicians, are not going to um, uh, stand back and, so, and sort of look over your shoulders, which suits the UK system because we have a very, very weak civilian political oversight um, process. But uh, what it does is it gives budget responsibility to people who are typically there for no longer than two years, you know, possibly they double tour, but no more than that. The Levine reforms are failing. And what you heard in uh, Sir Michael's speech was comments that um, it's up to the services to make their choices. He said that twice in slightly different ways. That's a really clear signal that the services are making their choices. Their choices do not uh, collectively add up. So they might do individually for the Navy, the Air Force or the Army, add all three together, put in Joint Forces Command and you get the bubble. You get the 10, 20, 30 billion of extra spending. And I think that's a real uh, problem, it's a real warning sign. I would not want to be wearing a uniform at the moment because I can hear the politicians starting to look for, uh, look for scalps, look for people to blame, and that never ends well. 
to that end, I mean, let me let me pull on that string a little bit because he's saying the service chiefs are the ones who have the choice, and it yeah. struck me at the moment. And we had a very very tight amount of time with him to cover a lot of ground, and he was very generous to give us actually significantly more time than we were we were booked for. So you know, I'm I'm very appreciative of that, and I'm also appreciative of his candor. But the question I have is, if the service chiefs are the ones who are going to be deciding. Why has this decision been pulled up to the cabinet office and, and pretty much even taken away from the Ministry of, of Defense effectively? It's happening at a cabinet level on which capabilities are going to survive and which not. Well, the very simple answer is because it is becoming politically apparent that the Levine reforms, which devolved uh, authority and devolved responsibility down to the services, have failed, are failing. And uh, it's got to be stopped and it's got to be stopped politically at this stage rather than letting the, uh, the failure get worse. Very, very simple. Let's say this from the service chief's perspective, because from the service chief's standpoint, they are executing to a political plan that was approved by government in 2015. Granted, things are always changing, but from the military service chief's standpoint, um, at least you know, talking to friends of mine who are, who are in the departments and are wearing un the uniform, the concern is that the force is already on the razor's edge of being hollowed out. That over the years, in order to afford the equipment, the services have all dialed back on people, cut back on training, cut back on spares, and that it was to avoid the equipment, and now the equipment is also going to get hit. So it's a bit of a two-part question for you. Part number one is, does the government have an obligation to support that plan, or is the government within its rights in order to sort of change it? And the second thing is, are, we, are you toying with a hollow force at this point? I'll, I'll do, do that in reverse order. The UK is hollowing out very, very quickly indeed. The UK's armoured forces are very hollow. Uh, there are clear worries about the capabilities of our tanks, just the whole tank fleet, uh, as an example. And that may have significant knock-on effects to future programmes, warrior upgrade, MIV and so forth. That's, um, in fact, that's the canary in the coal mine uh, in all this. Mm -hmm.